Good morning. Welcome to worship on this very, very, very warm September morning. Um, hopefully the cold front will be blowing in. I hear it's only supposed to be 99 this week. So yes, that is encouraging. Yes, we would like to welcome members and attenders and visitors here to Agape Baptist Church this morning. If you are a visitor, there is a visitor card in the, f the back end of the pew. If you would fill that out, we would love to have a record of your attendance and possibly even send you some information about what we do here at Agape. If you are interested in some more information, we have a number of uh, available information back in the Welcome Center if you would like to take that home with you or visit with your neighbor about some possibilities of serving here at Agape. We would also like to welcome our guest preacher this morning. Dr. Bruce Corley has come here. He is the president, senior fellow, and professor of New Testament and Greek at B.H. Carroll Theological Institute. Prior to his appointment to B.H. Carroll in 2003, he was dean of the School of Theology at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and served as professor of Christian scriptures of the George W. Truett Theological Seminary. Among the 25 books and essays he has written, there are commentaries on Romans and 2 Corinthians. He is presently completing a commentary on Hebrews and a research book on Paul. Bruce and his wife Linda are well known by the Agape congregation. Dr. Corley is the Bible study leader at, at the Staten and is in great demand around the world, <laughs> around the state of Texas, as a supply preacher on most Sundays. And so we are honored to have him here this morning and we look forward to hearing you. You know many of the requests for prayer for the congregation, others that are unspoken. Let's join together and pray together.
Heavenly Father, it is first for us to give thanks for your blessings in our lives. We know that every good and perfect gift comes down from you. We're grateful for your faithfulness to us day by day. We pray this morning for people who have special requests for uh, friends, families, members of this congregation and in other places. We pray for Jerry, that you will bless her as she faces eye surgery. We pray for young Rachel, that you will treat her vision problems. For those on the prayer request of Agape Baptist Church, we ask that you would intervene with your care, give wisdom for caregivers and doctors and family, give strength and courage, bless every need. We pray for people this morning, both near and far. We are reminded of a world in conflict and especially of a uh, civil war that rages in the country of Syria that now has global implications. We pray for wisdom among those who are decision makers in high places of authority. We pray for people on the ground who face great difficulty and distress. We pray that your will might prevail, that mercy and justice will find a way to be strong. We pray also for this congregation in a time of transition in pastoral leadership. We pray for your care and guidance. Be with the church. Give it encouragement and uh, direction for days ahead. It is our prayer in Jesus' strong name. Amen.
rejoice. We will in rejoice. The Lord. We will in rejoice. The Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. We will rejoice in the God of our salvation. He never fails. Is never weary. He gives his strength. To the weak, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as he. They will run and not be weary. They will walk, will walk and faint not. Will walk and not faint. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They Never blossom if no fruit is on the vine. If the fields yield no grain, if no herd is in the stalls, we will still rejoice in the Lord. We, we will, will still rejoice in the Lord. We will still rejoice. We will still rejoice. This sermon is partially to be blamed on Benji Big Dog Harlan. He is the person who arranged the piece that Bruce and Nancy sang. It's a placing together of two passages, one from Isaiah 40 and the other from Habakkuk 3. This is Isaiah. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. 
They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And then Habakkuk 3. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit lie in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Both Isaiah and Habakkuk belong to a crowd that could be described as white knucklers. You know, people going from here to there who grab on and their knuckles turn white because they're afraid. I've seen it most often on airplanes. And many people, most of us, have experienced it. Wherever or whatever it might be, holding on tightly for fear, afraid to go on. The sermon title is For People Who Are Afraid to Go On. In Larry McMurtry's book, The Streets of Laredo, there is a scene where a young deputy and his partner are pinned down by Killer Desperado on the banks of the Rio Grande. Dodging bullets, digging behind a log, the deputy says to his friend, how far is it back? And the friend says, back where? And the deputy replies, back where it ain't like this. I, Bruce Corley, as an adventuring young college student, decided to become a cave explorer, a spelunker. In the Cookson Hills near Tahlequah, Oklahoma, there's a place called the Bat Cave. And a friend and I went in descending far and deep. We passed mounds of bat guana coating flashlights and at a low place in the cave we pulled out a match to light a candle and it would not burn. I decided I'm not going any farther <laughs> and I went back. By the way I've never been in a cave again. <laughs> When you're afraid to go on, all of us get there. Old people and young people, families and churches get afraid to go on. What do these white knucklers, Isaiah and Habakkuk, have to say for us? You say, well, we're not in the same situation. No, theirs was worse. They had lived through a century of war and invasion and both prophesied and saw the fall of their beloved city, Jerusalem. If you read the book of Lamentations, you get a feeling for the kind of despair that these people must have felt. Yet Isaiah and Habakkuk have uh, an unbreakable trust in the future. Why? Well first it is obvious that they wait on a powerful God. Isaiah calls him the everlasting God. In verse 31 our translation which is the NIV which I read says hope in the Lord but if you know this verse from the King James Bible and from the song it says 
wait on the Lord. And it is a word for waiting. So the passage is not about people who are faint hearted. It's not about going on. It is about waiting. In the Bible there are three kinds of waiting. The first two don't count for much. The first one is a husband or a wife as the case may be who says I'm waiting for him. That is he's late. He's delayed. I'm waiting for something to happen. I hear that kind of waiting a lot. There is a second, a servant who waits on another. At table, taking care of the needs of someone as a waiter. But the third is the important one, and it dominates waiting in the scripture. It is expectant looking as waiting in a hospital room or waiting for an answer to an important question. Even God waits. In Isaiah 5, the scripture describes God as looking expectantly for grapes in the vineyard of Israel. And he finds none. Israel produces wild grapes. So God isn't simply looking because they are delayed. He is expecting something to happen. So the word both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament means to wait eagerly. There's a beautiful picture of it in Romans chapter 8 where Paul describes the created order in difficulty, groaning in travail. But it waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God on the resurrection day. That kind of expectant waiting is spelled hope. Those who hope in the Lord. In Isaiah, this word literally means to bind to oneself, to take a conviction that something you trust in will come to pass. Only here and in Genesis is God described as the everlasting God, El Olam. It doesn't mean that he is timeless. It means that he is timely. That is, always on time and without wearing out. Isaiah 40 is the chapter of the dependable God. He can do it and he will. And we are supposed to know this. So why is it that people do not have expectancy for what God will do? Well, that is my second point. We have difficulty coming to grips with human frailty. Notice the words that are used. Weary, weak, Tired, stumbling. And then Habakkuk describes a farm where there's nothing left. No produce, no flock, no hope for the future. That is the human condition. But it tends to betray us. We start thinking we have this under control. We are smart enough and strong enough to get it done by ourselves. 
And it is that weakness of pride that betrays us. There are disasters written all over history of people who know better, but they still trust in themselves. Let me give you some examples. The Donner Party in 1846 and 47 set out for California A, 87 of them. Only 47 of them were rescued. You know what happened to them. They went down a wrong trail. They were caught in a snowstorm and despaired and decided to not go on. And over half of them died there at the hands even of their own families. Robert Falcon Scott in 1911 set out for the South Pole walking toward disaster. He had poor transport, insufficient food, and he made slow progress. He finally reached the pole. They were overtaken by a great storm in a winter wasteland. In 1912, in a fierce blizzard, he wrote his last words. We cannot go on. And he died there. The Donner Party could not carry out the plan. The Falcon Party could not carry out the plan. They believed too much in their own strength and it destroyed them. One of my favorite stories is 2 Kings chapter 7. Four leprous men sitting at the gate of Samaria. Now this is their situation. Behind them there is famine in the city. No one has anything to eat. In fact people are sacrificing not only the dogs but also the children. And out before them is a Syrian army, Arameans, who are besieging the city of Samaria. And they're outside the city wall because the people inside don't let them in. And the people outside, the Syrians, would do them in. So here they sit. And one of them asked a question. And boy is it a good question. Why sit we here till we die? You know if you have figured out that behind you is death and before you is death, then you're going to die. Why not risk something? And they do. They decide, let's go out into the camp of the Syrians. If they take us in, we'll live. If they don't, we'll die. We're going to die anyway. And they go. Well, guess what? A prophet stood in the midst of Israel and said, in a week's time, God will drive the Syrians away and there will be food for plenty in the city. They hadn't heard that, but when they went to the camp, it was empty. God had stirred the bushes and the Syrians thought that they were being surrounded by a massive army and they ran away for their lives, deserted the camp. And the four lepers find paradise. Why? Because they came to grips with their condition. You can't help yourself if you cling to yourself. I don't care what kind of experience, credentials, plans that you make. If you do not believe you are weak and weary and stumbling, you'll never get help. And help is always available to the weak and weary. 
It's an amazing thing to me that God's grace works best for people who realize their need. And I need to say to you, there is no church anywhere that makes it by trusting in itself. I can take you all over Tarrant County to come, uh, congregations that have come and gone. Churches that were once very, very strong. Large churches. And the twist and turn of demographics, jobs, people changing to this or that, leaves these places as empty shells. And it is a tragedy. These churches look at themselves and say, What happened? Cast your weaknesses on the Lord. Trust in Him. Wait expectantly on Him. Both Isaiah and Habakkuk were visionary. The Lord revealed to them what was happening and what would happen. And they shared it with the southern kingdom of Israel. Habakkuk was commanded to write his vision and post it on a signboard. Habakkuk chapter 2 describes a prophet putting up an LED sign on the freeway telling them what was about to happen. And in that passage, the Lord says, wait for the vision to come to pass. It will not delay. Don't get puffed up. The righteous will live by faith. And that is the promise of both prophets. That people of faith trust God's promise of restored strength. Soaring, running, walking, those are promises of spiritual help and strength for all the seasons of life. And for some, this appears to be a declension. Well, you, everybody wants to fly. Some people want to run, but others just have to settle for walking. In fact, it works just the other way. Not that many fly. Not everyone runs, but everybody walks. And for day by day existence, you need walking strength to keep from fainting. Do you remember the name Eddie Edwards? You have to go back to 1988. He's one of my favorite characters. He was a plasterer from Cheltenham, England. Short, stout, scruff of a man with a red top knot. He wore pink horn rimmed glasses, constantly pushed them up so he could see. And his articulate manner was belied by what he was doing and what he looked like. He entered the Calgary Olympics in the 90 meter ski jump. Now where do you train for ski jumping in Cheltenham, England? Well he got on the sides of grass hills and put out cardboards and slid down them on his skis. 
He was not actually qualified to enter the Olympics, but by force of will, he managed to get in and take one jump. Eddie was afraid. His fellow jumpers threw him off the hill. And he slid down sideways on his back and crumbled at the end. But he was happy. He was called Eddie the Eagle. He placed 58th in the 90 meter jump. But he won fans all over the world because he was absolutely incompetent but a competitor. He went down the hill. Now whether it is soaring or running or walking or flopping God gives help to people who lean on him. And there was a big turnaround that came in Israel. No one expected it, but God restored his people. He does it in the lives of individuals. He does it in the lives of churches. Wait on the everlasting God. Be expectant that he will help you. Come to grips with your own weakness. Expect a change for the better. You know the story of the frog prince. The beautiful youngest daughter of the king lost her golden ball deep in a water well. Weeping, an ugly frog appeared and asked what she would do if he would retrieve the golden ball. And she said, whatever you want. He didn't want her treasures. He wanted her love and companionship. She promised. He plopped in, came up with the ball. She took the ball and left, forgetting the promise that she made. But the frog did not forget. He waddled his way the next day to the king's door, and he croaked out, King's youngest daughter, open to me. By the well water, what promised you me? And she said, I told him I'd take him in. And her father said, that you must do. The frog ate at table and then asked to sleep in the daughter's silken bed. She carried him by the thumb and finger and threw him in the corner of the room. But the frog said, no, I shall have the bed. When she threw him on the pillow, every girl's dream came true. He turned into a handsome prince. With kind eyes. The frog had been bound by the spells of a wicked witch. And only the kiss of a beautiful daughter could release him. You say, what does that have to do with me and Agape Baptist Church? We are dethroned princes turned into frogs. And there needs to be a frog kisser. That is not a preacher. An interim or a permanent. That is not a deacon. That is not a convention. God is a frog kisser. He's the only one who could stand to do it.
God evidently has strange taste. Anyone who doubts that we would be tough to kiss has never looked us full in the face. But it is the kiss of God that changes churches. My prayer for agape is for a magic kiss of God to happen. Trust in nothing less than that. Promote, plan, nothing less than that. And whether you will soar or run, I know you can walk. And that is the strength that's needed. Let's pray together. Father, from of old you have made promise and been faithful. Through generations of change in this world, you have preserved your witness among your people. Bless this congregation with your powerful hand. Give renewed strength. Give a way ahead. For the individual here this morning who is afraid to go on, beset by problems in life, some that no one else knows about, we pray for your strong hand. Invade that life, bring them to the loving Christ. May they know the change of grace. And for all of us, transform us by your presence and your power. Help us to turn to you just now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, 472, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. The Lord has put a decision in your heart and mind. You know you ought to make it publicly. This is the time for you to do that. You might want to become a Christian, to believe on Christ for the first time. Or to join this fellowship. Or to be baptized to follow the Lord as one of his disciples. Perhaps you're a longtime Baptist church member and you have need of renewal and restoration. If the Lord speaks to you, you come as we sing. Let's stand together. Would you be seated, please? Thank you so very much for that wonderful sermon and message from God. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did and was really moved um, throughout the sermon. I have a few announcements. Um, some, a number of things are going on today and this month. This afternoon, we have a wedding shower for Luke and Barbie at 2.30 in Faith Hall. And so I hope that you join us. It is come and go. And so we would love to have you there. They are getting married in October. It's 22nd. 19th, way off, October 19th, it's a Saturday, not a Monday, um, in Lubbock, Texas, and so we hope that you will join us at 2.30 to 4 o'clock this afternoon. The vision assessment team has asked me to make an announcement about next Sunday evening's vision assessment team feedback session, um, and so if you will just listen as I read their announcement. In reviewing the preliminary facility plan with the Deacon Chairman, the 2014 Task Force Chairman, and two members of the Financial Stewardship Team, it was the general consensus that the facilities required to support the churches will as, a, will as expressed during the 20, July 21st feedback meeting and provided to the congregation on July 28th is not financially realistic. Therefore, the vision assessment team will have a follow-up session next Sunday evening, that's September 15th at 6 o'clock, where you will further discuss alternatives, including more detailed financial information. You will find the presentation in the back of the worship center that we'll be giving during the session. Please take a copy, read it, and plan on attending the feedback session. 
The session will provide you the opportunity to comment, ask questions, and complete a very short evaluation form at the end of the meeting. Please bring the presentation with you to the meeting. Your review and feedback are necessary in order that considerations reflect the will of the church. Also during the next week, please pray that the meeting will assist in bringing the church together in unity as we move forward in making critical decisions related to the development of a preliminary facility plan for your review. I would encourage you all to be there September 15th, a week from this evening at 6 o'clock. We would love to have as many of you as possible to give feedback on the direction of the church. Have a wonderful afternoon. Will you please stand as we have a word of prayer for our benediction? Father, we thank you for this time that we get to come together. And I pray that uh, the message that was spoken today would, would rest on our hearts and that we would start to lean wholly upon you, um, not depending on our own strength or our own expertise, God, but that we would truly seek you out, that so we would be unified in a church and that we might move forward. It's in your name we pray. Amen.